And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode three of the YM 101 show for August 21st, 2016, streaming live tonight from Huzzah.io. And hopefully it's streaming live tonight on Facebook. Um, tonight we have a special guest, a uh, friend of mine when I first got into this business, uh, known him since, since he was a salesperson for a craft beer distributor out here in Connecticut. Let me get him on the channel. Coming to you live tonight from undisclosed location in <laughs> Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Yes. Northeast regional manager for Ballast Point Brewing out in San Diego, California, Jeff Nelson. Thanks for coming on tonight, Jeff. How you doing? Chris, good. How are you? Yeah, I was trying to think today, uh, probably we first met probably 2002 or three. 2003. No, down in in, no, 2003. Right. My son's going to be 13 this year. Right. Yeah. So 2003, uh, I think I was selling you some uh, Newport Storm, I think. Down yeah, you were hustling uh, me to do a Newport Storm, Storm pay, tasting. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. How's how are they doing now? Oh, they, hey, they're still around. So uh, I think they're uh, they've been around 15 years, I think. Oh, maybe, really? Maybe a little longer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, last week I talked about so, something similar with Brian. How do all these craft beers I mean, especially in Connecticut, because we're so small. How do they all survive on the shelf? I mean, Ballast Point sticks out because it's a certain style, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, somebody that's really heavily into the craft beer world, uh, not only that, you are a whiskey aficionado, you are a wine drinker, you're a cheese guy, you're you know a foodie like me. Um, but specifically in the craft beer world, how do all these brands stand out? What what separates one from the next? I mean, they have to create identity and everything else, no? They do. And, and if you remember back 13 years ago, there there wasn't uh, obviously the proliferation that there is today. I mean, there's, uh, there's now uh, almost 4,000 breweries either open or in planning in the United States. Uh, you know, just uh, like we were talking before we went on the air, it was just up in Vermont. And it was in an account. They said, you know, there's now 50 breweries in Vermont. There's not that many people in Vermont, you know, but uh, w- what makes it survive is first off is quality. You know, quality is, is you know, not to steal from a car commercial, but quality is job one. So if you're making a, a good product, that's, you know, it starts there. And right. then, uh, you know, we, we have a saying at Bell's Point, it's about the beer and the people. So, so it's about the liquid, but it's also about the people that are out there representing your brand. Uh, whether that is whiskey, you see the whiskey behind me, or or wine, or or, or you know beer, or cheese, or, or whatever, you know, it's it's really about the people, right? Um, and then yeah, you know, product, uh, you know, uh, look at Connecticut. I was talking to a, a bar owner the other day, and remember again, if we we go back 13 years ago, we were talking about wow, there's no quote unquote good beer in Connecticut, and now look at it, now there's right. We got some great breweries, and you know, one I know you and I have, have, have talked about a lot, and over the last thirteen years, or is you know New England Brewing, you know, and they they've stayed the Absolutely. course, they've you know, and but I remember the days when we couldn't. Uh, I tried to sell you know a couple of cases of Sea Hag to people, and they're like, no, I don't want that, bah! you know, and now it's like you'd be happy if you got two cases of Sea Hag, you know? right? No, you'd be ecstatic if you could get two cases of Sea right. Hag. But remember those days? I mean. Yeah. Here, here was a guy shopping around a canned beer from Connecticut, and everybody was like, I don't want it. I don't want it. You know, uh, Atlantic Amber. You remember? Yep. City yep. Uh, yep. Nobody. I mean, they took it in because you always want to support the local guy. But, you know, it was it was like force feeding it to people. They come out. They do tastings. Great. Fantastic. Nobody really embraced the whole can thing. Now look at right. it. Like you said, look at them now. You're lucky to even get a case of that. Right. You know? So, uh, so again, you know, it's, it's fighting for shelf space and, and quality, like I said, stands out first. And then knowing that, hey, hey, I know Matt and Rob, and I've known Matt, Rob, Matt and Rob for 13 years. So, yeah, I want to support them. You know, so as a local retailer, and you've been on the retail side, too, you know, you want to support that local guy. But the, the, the beer or the, or the cheese or the wine, it's, uh, it needs to be quality. Yeah. Whoops, your audio went down. Uh-oh. There you go. You're back. Okay. Yeah, just like cheese, we have a mutual friend in uh, Brian Civitello, yep. Mystic Cheese Company. Same thing. I mean, I knew Brian before he got into that. And again, it goes back to a relationship. You knew the kid. He was, I mean, he was talented back then. You know, it, his F ups were fantastic. You know, I remember <laughs> he, he was making a cheese, which uh, you're familiar with the Italian t- cheese called Telegio. Yep. He made, he was trying to make something like that. It came out too firm. And he was like, Full of disappointment. I saw him down at the farmer's market one day. He's like, 
it came out bad. I don't like it. He goes, I'll give it to you for 10 bucks a wheel. And you know, 10, you know, whatever it was, five, five pound wheel. I'm like, this stuff is fantastic. Yeah. It was a little firmer than like the, uh, what do you call it? The hooligan from, uh, Cato corner. Yeah. But same thing. You, now that he's on his own, you want to support him as much as you can. Cause you know, there's quality behind that thing. You know, Absolutely. What producing. yeah. So coming from salesperson, you made the jump over to stone brewing, correct? Another big California yep. brewing company, something we were in Connecticut, going back to what you were saying, you know, there, people are saying there's no good beers in Connecticut. You know, oh, I wish stone was here. Boom. All of a sudden stones here, you know, and you were big into pushing that all through new England. No. Yeah, I mean, so that was, uh, you know, I, I said I made a career switch at uh, age 40, uh, but really I was in the same career, but jumped from being a local distributor to working for, you know, a, a pretty huge nationwide brewery. And we had kicked off Stone here in Connecticut in 2009. Right. And uh, I started working for them in 2011. And uh, again, managed to uh, sold beer throughout New England. And then this opportunity came along with Bowles Point. And uh, I got a chance to manage a team of, I have a team of three people across New England now. Oh, okay. So, which, yeah. Which is, uh, which is great to help spread the word. Um, you know, we, uh, and we can get more into the brewery, but we, we turned uh, 20, uh, we'll celebrate our 20th anniversary um, in a couple of weeks out in San Diego. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. So it's, uh, it's pretty insane. Uh, when I first started, uh, we first started selling Dallas Point here in Connecticut in 2008. We made a little less than eleven thousand barrels, and last year we made over two hundred seventy thousand barrels. So it's a it's Perfect. it's a huge jump. It's a huge oh, jump, and, but uh, obviously uh, fans in Connecticut, and New England, and all over the country are supporting it. So we continue to we continue to grow. Now, Ballast Point, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but San Diego based, correct? Correct. Uh, started as a homebrew shop uh, back in 1992, founded by uh, Jack White, who uh, had gone to UCLA and wanted to get into to brewing. So opened a homebrew shop. And as he tells the story, he's just like, OK, open the doors. And, you know, no one walked in for a few days. And uh, right. then all of a sudden uh, people started trickling in. And, and, and again, you got to think about 1992, not a whole lot of homebrewers. But certainly San Diego is still a, a, a pretty good core of, of, of brewing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, across, uh, you know, over the years, we expanded from that small little brewery in uh, at the Home Brew Mart to uh, in 1996 uh, to now we have four breweries in San Diego. Actually just opened a fifth uh, restaurant in uh, Sour Brewery in, in up in Long Beach. Uh, opened a restaurant in Temecula and... Uh, we we announced this year that uh, we're going to open a brewery in Virginia, so uh, that should uh, should be open sometime next yeah. year. Um, you know, to joining uh, the guys from Stone and New Belgium yeah. and and a bunch of other breweries here in Nevada on the East Coast. Yeah, right. I was going to say, are you moving the? Are you building a physical plant out here to do the brewing out here as well? Yep. Or so we'll be brewing on two coasts. So yeah. uh, which is going to be pretty pretty amazing. That's huge. Yeah. Now, what about going overseas yet? Right? Have you done that? Like, a lot of these uh, is going overseas, but that might be a little, a little. Yeah, I know. I believe the tally that we're up to now is thirteen different countries. Um, wow! If, if you think about the easy ones, not easy, but per se, the, the Pacific Rim company, so uh, yeah. country. So we're in. Uh, we're in. I know we're in Korea. I know we're in uh, Japan. Uh, I know we're in uh, England, and I believe Sweden, and I know Australia. Wow. So. Um, and then uh, by the end of the year, we should be in all 50 states. Just opened up Tennessee uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Louisiana is coming up. And then I think it, that league is just uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Arkansas, I believe. Oh, wow. So, I mean, yeah. Ballast points everywhere, pretty much. Yeah. So it's uh, – it's, to that point. Yeah, no, we're, we're pretty lucky, like I said, that uh, people around the, around the, well, the country and around the world uh, love good beer. Yeah. But not only beer, Ballast Point delves into other sectors as well. Spirits, Spirits uh, mixers. Yeah, mixers. So, uh, you know, it's pretty diverse. And like I said, I mentioned we have uh, currently two uh, large-scale restaurants. Uh, you know, uh, actually three. Sorry, Temecula, Long Beach, and our headquarters in Miramar also have a restaurant. So, uh, you know, we have a chef who uh, runs the whole program, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, pretty good food. It's not just your typical bar food of wings and burgers. So. So is he, when he creates his food menu, is he basing it around the ballast point selection of beers? Is he matching different styles of cuisine to 
pair up with beers? Is that something he focuses on or no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like, just like uh, folks here do beer dinners, we've done some, yeah. some beer dinners and obviously, yes, his, you know, his seasonal menus are, are, are built around, Hey, you know, something we're probably going to taste in a little bit, the dead ringer and uh, the pumpkin. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you do absolutely. a lot of beer dinners. I mean, you're very old school, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, but the, the way you approach this. Look at these guys. These guys. <laughs> yeah, all of us have gray in the beard. Yeah, now. that's true. But uh, your approach to sales is very old school, and I, that's that's what I respect about you. When you know other other salespeople like you, you're out there. You're hitting the road. Uh, you know, you're knocking on doors. You you know, you're you're out there. Um, I think you call it herding cats every morning, right? Yeah. Every, every, well, no, I'm literally herding cats, but. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, now well, we have some cats, but uh, I mean no. that's the, that's a realistic end of the craft or any sector really. But I mean I think there's a lot of people fresh out of college. Maybe they're into craft beer, maybe they're into wine, and they say, "Oh, I'm going to go out there, taste taste beer and wine all the time, do dinners." And, and the real end of it is, I mean, it's hard work. You got to put foot to pavement, you know, pedal to the metal, and get it out there. It just it doesn't sell itself. Right. I mean, no matter how, it, it, again, no matter how big I say the brands are, whether it's Ballast Point or Stone or, or, you know, we were just talking about some whiskeys earlier and, you know, you have to go out and be the face of that brand. Mm-hmm. So you right. need to, uh, if you're a restaurant owner, you're a retailer. If I don't walk into your store, it's out of sight, out of mind. There's plenty of other choices to be had out there. We just right. mentioned 4,000 breweries in the country. Right. So if right. I'm not Jeff from Ballast Point walking into Mr. You know, Mr. Chris's restaurant, yeah then why, why do you want to carry my beer? Right. And I, I've been doing that for the past couple of months. I've been pushing around a, a wine brand. It's the same thing. It's a, it's a small eclectic brand. I mean, the juice is good. Yep. Uh, but it's like, how do you, how does a small niche product like that fit into this, you know, bigger world? And it's getting out there, putting a name to it. You know, when you walk into a store, you know, they, you know, people get to know you, you know, they, they develop a relationship with you. Even if it is for that three hour window that you're tasting in a store, but they know it's you know it's a good product, but if you're not there doing it, how how much is it going to sell? And that's that's what I'm finding out now. If I'm not there tasting it, you know, the owners of the brand don't necessarily you know they're looking at the sales saying, uh, as a question coming up. But uh, if you're not in the store tasting, if you're not making the sales, don't go back to that store. And you're trying to explain to them, you know, it, you have to be there. It's such a small eclectic brand. You know, I've been in. I mean, you've been in, on the retail end too. I think right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, it's where I started my career working for a, a family grocery store, not my family store, right. but a uh, family gro- right. chain of grocery stores, and then moved yeah. into the retail side on, on, on the liquor side. So, same with me. Yeah. yeah. So you're stop and shop and same thing. If, if, if you're not there in that store, I mean, granted, maybe you sell a case one week, maybe you sell a case and a half the next week. On the weeks you're not there, the stuff's not selling. So what would you rather have? Would you rather have somebody in the store just getting the name out? Right, and it's all but it's also building a relationship with the retailer. I mean, again, think back 13 years ago when I walked into your account, you're like, "All right, who's this guy?" And uh, you know, <laughs> probably not going to buy beer for me the first sales call, but right. uh, but you know, now it's building that relationship to say, "Hey, you trust me enough to be like, hey, Chris, I know your store. I know what you know. Right. I know my product. I, I think this is a great fit for your store." Um, you know, and at Ballast Point, we talk about uh, you know, it's not selling beer; it's telling stories. So every beer has a has a story to tell. Every wine, you know, the wine behind you has a story to yeah. tell. Every bottle of whiskey yeah. has a story to tell. Yeah. And, uh, and you keep telling that story and that builds that relationship. And there's there's somebody on the chat room side, the viewer tonight, Justin. He's he's big into whiskey out in California. I forget exactly who he works for, but you're speaking his lingo right now. We'll, <laughs> talk, we'll talk about that after we talk about Ballast Point. Uh, but a question just popped up from my friend Jen from uh, Wine Antics on Twitter. She's asking, where in Virginia is Ballast Point going to be? So it's going to be uh, in a call, in a town called Daleville, which is just outside of, uh, just outside of Roanoke. So okay. uh, a nice piece of property just outside of Roanoke. Uh, an existing building that we're going to retrofit to a brewery. Uh, we already have the uh, the brew house is on its way from Germany, if not here already. So, uh, again, looking at sometime uh, early next year, maybe, or hopefully – uh, you know, by midsummer next year, getting some beer uh, from Virginia. So, fantastic. Uh, will you still be sending stuff over from the West Coast? Yeah, I'm not quite sure the- how it's going to break down. If you look at some of the breweries now, I know Sierra Nevada that you know they're growing uh, obviously the pale ale out, out in North Carolina, and probably some specialty beers. And uh, other breweries are probably doing a bunch of the core beers and then some specialty beers. Mm-hmm. So, it, uh, you know, depending on how uh, the, uh, how they want to break it up, but. Um, it'll be probably mostly core beers and we'll have a tasting room and 
I will probably have a restaurant as well. So okay, that's awesome. Now, when we talk about IPAs, because mostly Ballast Point is known for their IPAs, correct? Yeah, well, it's funny. Uh, it, I think most uh, most San Diego brewers are probably known for their IPAs. Yeah. So you know, we that's what I was going to talk about. Yeah, we reference Stone, and you know, you got brands like uh, Green Flash and uh, yeah. and all kinds of other great breweries out there. But uh, here at Ballast Point, we make everything from a Wahoo wheat to a uh, to a Imperial Russian Stout. But obviously, our flagship beer is the Sculpin. Uh, mm-hmm. So, which I think we're gonna we're gonna drink a little bit tonight. Um, yep. But we have uh, we have Sculpin, we have grapefruit Sculpin, we have pineapple oh. Sculpin. Uh, excuse me, my dog has joined the podcast here. No, I had to lock my door because they're ready to break it down. <laughs> here. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our flagship here, I think what we're gonna talk about is uh, oh. hey, is our is the Ballast Point. Hey, there we go. Yep. Yeah, there's there's the dog. Yep. Um, the the one thing I do want to mention about Ballast Point, if you're a fan, if you, if you look. Uh, we look at the artwork. Oh, gotta go this way. There it is. Cheryl had a bottle up tonight. Yeah. So uh, all the artwork is done by one gentleman. His name is Paul Elder. He's a, a San Diego native, a fisherman, a kayaker, uh, just all around great guy. And he does. If if you see all our labels, they're all drawn by Paul, uh, which is pretty amazing. So I'm drinking a beer that's uh, pretty fresh. Was brewed uh, in late July. So. Uh, uh-huh. Uh, and I'm like self-promoting the Bows Point pint glass here. So nice. Now, are you are you big into the glassware? No, you know here's here's the thing. I learned this uh, I learned this a long time ago, and I don't know. I, I've learned it from, I've heard it from a couple of people, and and one of them is you know hey listen as long as you're drinking good liquid, it really doesn't matter what you're drinking it out of. So hey, if you want to drink Opus One out of a red Solo cup, okay, go for it. You know and. Uh, <laughs> As a guy who's on the road a lot, I drink a lot of good liquid out of, yeah. out of hotel uh, coffee cups. So right, uh, right. You know, do what you got. Yeah, there. You know, there is a method to the madness, as you know. Right. You know, with wine, it's, it opens it up and it's breathable. Yeah. And you know, same thing with if you're drinking a Belgian beer. You know, it, it opens it up. But you know, the standard shaker glass, it, it works for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just I like these little glasses for whatever. It reminds me of the old jelly jar glasses we used yep. to drink out. <laughs> Ginzo Sunday dinner table, yep. you know. Oh, you mean the old, you mean the little shrimp cocktail glasses that you used to get? You remember those little ones? No. Oh. You remember the Welch's yes. jelly jars? Yes, absolutely. Tom and Jerry or yep. whoever yep. on it, Woody Woodpecker. Yeah, those those were our wine glasses. <laughs> so yeah, so we're gonna we're both drinking the Sculpin IPA, sort of our, our flagship IPA. Uh, first came out in two thousand five, and as I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, we have a lot of homebrewing history, and th- this beer actually has homebrewing history. It was two two gentlemen that worked at uh, at our homebrew mart, and still do to this day. Uh, created this recipe, and they were entering it in, in contests around San Diego. And our uh, our head brewer Colby Sawyer, uh, Colby Chandler, sorry, uh, Colby uh, tasted it and said, "Hey, can I modify this recipe a bit? Combine the best of both your recipes." And they said sure, and uh, and Scopin was created, and we threw it on at the at the tasting room, and people loved it. And here we are, uh, eleven years later, and uh, you know, drinking it. Uh, to, and and again, our number one selling beer across the country. I mean, uh, aromatics off this thing are incredible. Are they using? I know a lot of guys are getting into like real hop specific. Are, are yeah. they there? Is it a certain hop profile that they're utilizing? Right. So specific hops in in, in Scope and are Simcoe and Amarillo, and, and both those okay. hops uh, kind of give a, a tropical hop note. Yeah. So yep. uh, peach, mango, uh, those oh, kind yeah, of flavors. Yep. Um, so again, the fruit notes from the hops, not from any fruit added, but that lent no. As we talk about grapefruit and pineapple. That tropical fruit note adds to adding fruit to it. Um, so, uh, Sculpin is kind of atypical to a, or a, not a traditional West Coast IPA, again, because of the tropical hops. Uh, we have another IPA called Big Eye, it lends itself to more of that, that citrusy, grassy hop that most, some, some of the West Coast IPAs are known for. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Now, you hear a lot of guys in craft beer chat rooms and everything talking about West Coast IPAs versus East Coast IPAs. What is is there a difference, and what is the big difference in any? <laughs> right, uh, it's, a, it's a huge debate right now. So I mean, we'll yeah. just we'll just look at this beer right now, and obviously you yeah. can see it's very very clear, uh, yeah. very nicely refined. Um, so the East Coast style IPA has now kind of. Uh, become it looks like you're drinking a glass of orange juice so it's now this argument of it's very murky very cloudy lots of hot residue i yeah. uh, can't see through it 
Um, now, a stank. Yeah, it is, uh, you know, smells like something that's probably not hops. You know, I had a beer yesterday from uh, had a beer from uh, Trillium last night at the beer okay. fest, and you know, you, 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 it smell, smells like a uh, hmm, smells like something else that I know that smells like that. Um, but again, so this debate be, this debate becomes let's 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 go back to the glassware debate. So it goes well, okay. Do you who cares if you like it and it tastes good? Does it really have to define a style? And then we have to say, hey, East Coast, West Coast. Hey, right. if you drink it and you like it and people enjoy it, then so be it. You know, right. uh, I had a chef uh, in Boston tell me a long time ago. It's like uh, learning to play music. You learn the chords, and once you learn the chords, you can do whatever you want. You don't need right. to. You don't need to, as long as you know the basics, it's like cooking. He says, well, he's he's like, I don't ever pigeonhole myself to a style. I don't say, oh, I'm a, an American chef, I'm a French chef, or I'm an Italian chef. I, right, right. I cook whatever I feel like. It's so same thing. If, if, if East Coast breweries want to make really dank and sticky IPAs, then so be it. I mean, I, I love drinking them. So, yeah, right. You know. Right. That's a, hey, I, I try anything, you know, I, I I don't look at it as uh, this one's better than the other. I mean, that's that's a huge thing where, you know, uh, I think it's more about supply and demand. You know, you always want what you can't get. So, I mean, that drives up the thing. Like a lot of guys out here are always saying, oh, uh, well, before, like you said, before it was stone, you know, before it was ballast point. I wish we could get ballast point out here. Now it's, you know, I wish we could get heady out here. I wish we could get Pliny right. out here. Right. And once it's here, it's always the next thing. You're always chasing. You're always going down that rabbit hole. You know, you're always searching for the next thing. Yeah, and I think I don't, I don't know that it's that way in the wine world. I certainly don't think that. Obviously, there's 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 high end wines that everyone yep. would want to chase, but we probably can't afford them. Uh, you know, if uh, it's sort of that way in the bourbon world, and you and I, you know, go way back on that. You know, uh, there's the yeah. there's, there's the uh, ever so uh, you know there's a Pappy Van Winkle. I didn't that, say it tonight, that, Jen. He said right, it that you can't get. <laughs> that there's a twelve year old in the cabinet behind me, but uh, see, this is the man um, that can get it. Um, <laughs> but there's so many other whiskeys out there. When you walk into any store that are uh, just as good, if not better, yeah. than than Pappy, and I'm not saying Pappy's bad, but hey, what about the whiskeys you can get every day? Yeah. Why do you have to chase that one that's that you can't get? And uh, you know right. that that is happening in the beer business. Uh, you know, there's plenty of beer on shelves, but there's plenty of beer. Uh, you know, the people standing in. Oh, that. Guy, oh, see, he's drinking Devil's Chair. I like that. I see that. That's Justin. Justin I see that. California. He does. He does a lot of bourbon and whiskey. I see that. Well, oh, we, we started the. I, we started yeah. the night with this, so uh, this is my <laughs> pregame. Uh, so that's the pregame show. But I uh, drinking victory at sea tonight. Yeah, we, we've we've created this kind of monster in the in the beer industry about you know people waiting in line for hours upon hours when they can go down to their local retailer and pick up some really great beer, uh, yeah, whether right. that's Bow's Point or right. the aforementioned Sea Hag or any of the you know right. any of the, the local game you know the local brands, uh, right? But there's always something out there. I mean, especially with somebody like you, it, you know, if you were in my store, I didn't have exactly. If you were in my store doing a demo. And maybe somebody didn't identify with the uh, Sculpin IPA. Yep. You start asking around, well, what do you like? And they start throwing out, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You could almost narrow down their palate from there, correct? Right. And, and the same, same, same idea, you know, on the line end. Hey, I don't have this particular brand of Chardonnay you're looking for, but I know that, hey, this one's, uh, you know, a little oaky. It's seen, it's seen some, you know, some oak. Or, oh, I know this one is, is aged in steel, so you're not getting that oakiness. So, right. yeah, well, that goes back to where we talked about. If you have a relationship with your with your right. customer and I have a relationship with you, we can narrow it down to, to, to yeah. anything, you know. It's all about talking. It's all about developing that relationship. That I mean, that's all old school. I mean, you know, how many times people come in the store and I love technology. I love the apps. You know, they're looking at Vivino. They're looking at Delectable. I mean, I'm on that, too. Yeah. But it's they're looking at somebody else's rating and saying, oh, well, he, you know, Joe Blow from uh, Minnesota said this Malbec was, uh, you know, 10, out, you know, 10 out of 10. I'm like, well, who's he? Right. You know, it's, you know, it's, I know you, you shop in my store. Talk to me, talk to me. I know what you buy. Joe doesn't know what you buy. You know, talk to me. I, you know, I want to get to know what you're doing with the, the wine, the beer, if you're going to pair it, if you're going to drink it on its own, you know, what you're looking for. Give us an idea of what you're looking for, you know, uh, I mean, in our world, you know, there's what I am. I'm a CSW. There's SOMs. Uh, there's people that take the WSET. Uh, I mean, in your world, they're called Cicerones, correct? Correct. And, you know, I, I, I'm i in uh, first level Cicerone, just the, the, the beer server, which is, you know, hey, it's, it's pretty common common sense. Right. And, 
You know, again, now it is. It, it, well, uh, there's, there's it, a lot of it is. And, and for me, I just know in the last 19 years, there's a lot, a lot of stuff I know, and, and a lot of things, a lot of stuff I know, a lot that I can help train your staff or restaurant staff. I, I think Cicerone is great, but it's also, again, it's one person's testing range. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, you know, the people that have gotten second level are amazing. I know a few of them. Um, I did a tasting with, with one the other day and she's actually on her, she's trying for her second level. And, you know, it, it's, it's more like, Hey, she can tell you the, the RSMs and all these other things, you know, whereas I'm just going, okay, I, 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 I can look it up. You know, but <laughs> but uh, same thing that someone asks you, hey, what's the bricks level of that that uh, cabinet oh. behind you? And you're like, I, right. I don't, I don't know. I can, I can ask, but you That's, know, I always tell people with stuff like that. You know, I especially when I teach my classes, my wine tasting classes, I steer away from stuff like that. And people always ask, well, why? I'm like, because you get that glass look over your face. I mean, your head starts thinking about other things. You're not interested in that stuff. You know, it, you want to get down to you know what it tastes like. Is it dry? Is it sweet? You know. I, what it pairs with, right. you know, you want to get down to all that. You're not, if you're interested in that, I'm more than happy to talk about it with you, but it's not my forte. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's the same thing as asking, you know, my wine background. I really love California cabs. I love Oregon yeah. Pinots. If someone yeah. asked me about French wines, I certainly can sell you one, but it's not my forte. I can point right. you to some, some Malbecs from Chile, but it's not, yeah. don't ask me any, anything else other than right. the, the two or three that I know that I drink, you know? I mean, it took me, you know, when I was early in my career in wine, a uh, gentleman from Slocum, Sam, Sam Dennis, remember him? Yep. When I run into him, I mean, the guy is phenomenal, and he's not arrogant about it. I went to a Slocum tasting, and I said, Sam, he was he was manning a Bordeaux table. Yep. I'm like, walk me through Bordeaux. Yep. I said, I don't, I don't have a grasp on it. He was phenomenal with it. He's like, here, just start with this. Let's, you know, we'll get into the bigger stuff later. And Understood it because he's there. We're, I mean, we actually have the stuff in front of us. Yep. You know, then he pointed me at the winemaker. Here, go down and talk to him about this right now. He's down at this table. And again, relationship, putting, yep. you know, putting the wine with the face, the person that makes it, you know, it, it helps. You know, that's what I tell people. Just pour a glass, get into it. Just like we did tonight. I mean, yeah. walk me through this. Skull. I mean, this is, this is, t- I mean, this is probably the limit of my hops. I mean, I like the bitterness on this, but yep. it's not overwhelming. So it is. I mean, it's uh, so, you know, talking about hops, obviously, the, the people that are listening and, and watching, obviously, we, we know what IBUs are. They're international bittering, bittering units. It's uh, it's uh, it again, kind of measures the hoppiness, but it's really re- it's all relative to your palate. I always ask people when they say, oh, it doesn't taste bitter to me or whatever. I'm like, first question, to, I'm sure you ask when you're tasting, like, are you a smoker? Because if you're a smoker, yeah. your palate's all messed up anyways. Right. right. Uh, I'm not saying, but it's just you have different senses, you know. So, right. Um, so theore- theoretically, uh, the 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 human tongue can taste uh, nothing over 100 IBUs. Um, so there are those hot battles out there where people make a thousand IPU uh, IBU beer, but it's really senseless. Um, this uh, Sculpin uh, happens to be 70 IBU, so kind of right in that mid range for an IPA. And again, those tropical hops kind of kind of if you're, if you, if you, hold on, the dog is saying, right. uh, so again, th- those tropical hops kind of are different than those big grassy West coast hops that typically are in IPAs. So. Right. I mean, this is, it's got good body to it. I mean, I, I'm always analyzing a beer like I analyze a wine. So and, am I wrong in doing that? No, I don't, I don't think so. Not at all. I mean, you know, obviously you did the first thing you do is, you know, you, you look for the bouquet, mm-hmm. you know, and you, Hey, it's got, it's got nice fresh hop aroma. And obviously it's got the, it's got the palate to back it up. Uh, I see uh, Justin asked a question over here about the uh, beer allocations. <laughs> oh, I didn't it's a that. tricky, the, uh, uh, how do I feel about them? I think we've both been there, Chris, where, you know, like I said, uh, hey, I got this really hot beer and you can have one case, you know. Yeah, um, we, we talked about that last week with Brian. It's like, how do you how do you play that that role to, the, you know, and so, you know, I mean, I'm not I, I talk about it with Matt sometimes when I see yeah. Matt, you know, even with you. It's like they they hear it. I mean, I know you guys hear it on your end from customers just hammering you, especially with social media. But yeah. I mean, we're on the we're on the front line of the war here. When people are disgruntled, we're the first line of defense, and they hammer us for it. And you know, it's like, how do you how do you pick and choose? I mean, it's 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 a tough it's a tough call. You know, uh, 
I got into a discussion on Facebook, uh, craft beer, Connecticut craft beer people the other day. They're, they're, they were disgruntled with uh, retailers hiding stuff in back, and it was a secret handshake. And I'm, I had to chime in. I'm like, you don't get it from the retail you know, end of it. And I gave them the example. Uh, when Founders came out, not Founders, Goose Island, when they come out with their bourbon stout every year, yep. uh, I got hammered. The drinks rep hammered me on it. He's like, why would you put that whole thing out? That's BS. You know, uh, customers taking as much as they want. I'm like, Cause I, you know what? It's it's They're here. They're buying. You know, make the sale. I don't run an antique shop here. You know, I want stuff moving out the door. And I got hammered. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I've been blessed, you know, both working for Stone and in Bowser Point. We don't have, I mean, everything is pretty much available to everyone, uh, you know, and it's based on, so that, that goes back to your relationship with the distributor and saying, hey, first of all, if you have enough beer to, to send them, then they should order enough so every store can get what they want. But we don't really have any limited secret handshake beers. Everything we make is in a large quantity and, and, and can go to people. Now saying that, hey, we might get 10 logs or something. So now yeah. it's not really allocated. It's just we go out there and we sell the 10 logs and maybe we get 10 right. more. Um, right. So again, that, that, I agree with you. I don't think that hiding stuff in the back room. Uh, so we've created that monster, right? Where whether it's Sip of Sunshine or, or Lawson Super Session or, or, or whatever, like I understand that you want your best customers to get that beer. But also, I think we're in the business to make money, right? So to your point, if you put the case of Goose Island out and you sell it all in one day, okay, yep. I did my job. But what my boss wanted me to do is sell, sell, it, right. sell something, you know? If it's, if it's 144 bucks a case on a case of beer, he wants to know why is it still here? Right. What, what do we sell it for? What, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, you know, I know Brian, you know, and his story gets – you know, hammered because, uh, you know, they're, they're four pack and sea hag or they're selling single cans. Right. It's a tough go, especially if you're not the owner of the store. Right. You know, Brian's a phenomenal, you know, manager, you know, yep. but he's at the front line getting <laughs> hammered by people. Yeah. He's getting killed on every thread on beer advocate on, you know, social media, he's getting killed and he has, it's out of his control. You know, he, he feathers it as much as he can. I mean, he's, He's probably the best in the business with customers, you know. But right, and we both know he has. To, we, we both know who he has to answer to. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Yeah, you, know, so, you were there on one end. Yeah, so yeah. I think I think it goes back to that that you know we've created this monster of waiting in line or allocations, and uh, you know beer should be for everybody. And again, yeah. it, it shouldn't be if there's an opportunity to get sip of sunshine, then hey, maybe you make a brand new customer, you know, right? Who's walked into your store for the first time. Out. Uh, oh, he is. Oh, yeah. Brian's on tonight, so shh, don't say anything. I won't say anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did pick up a third beer tonight. I probably should have poured this first. Oh, okay. Even yeah. Session. Yeah. So uh, uh, you know where we talk about uh, you know Bow's point, uh, Bow's point, Scopin being you know seven uh, little about seven percent. Uh, you know you can you can enjoy a few. Uh, even Keel is uh, three eight. So. Uh, okay. You know, people ask, ask the question all the time, where, where, did, the, where did the term session come from? Uh, well, uh, folks over in England, when they, when they got up in the morning, they went to their local bar at 9 a.m. to watch soccer or whatever they're watching. Uh, they wanted to drink a few beers. And, and whether that session be an hour or that session be all day, they wanted beers that they could drink in a session. And uh, bartenders like it. My thing to bar owners is, hey, listen. Someone may come into your restaurant and drink one scope because it's seven percent. They might have mm -hmm. two or three even keels over the course of time watching that ball game because right. yeah. again, it's three point eight, and you know you're, right. you're managing. Hey, I gotta I, I gotta drive or I gotta I gotta function later. I gotta go back to work. You know. Right. So uh, again, okay. uh, nice hop bouquet and uh, a, a nice really uh, drinkable beer. Uh, you know, we we hate to use the word crushable. I used that yesterday, and someone's like. Well, it's a crushable beer. Well, in a can, it actually you know makes sense, right? Because you can actually crush the can when you're done. But yeah, uh, right, right, right. I, I think that's the term now for beers that you can just sit back and, and, and throw you know three or four down you know after you mow the lawn. You could do a bluto on your forehead. Yes, exactly. See, it's, it's crushable. crushable. But the hop nose on it is real. It's not as in your face as a sculpin. Correct. I get a ton of. The it's it's a little muted than the last one. I mean, it still has a nice bouquet to it, but it's a little muted than the last one. Right. So I mean, the colors there. Yep. So we're talking. We you know we talked about uh, scoping being seventy IBUs. This is uh, almost almost half. It's forty. So again, okay. not as hoppy. 
lower in alcohol. And what I find is people that don't like IPAs may, this may be their foray into, oh, I think I like this. Like you mentioned before, it's not as bitter as, you know, some of these IPAs that are out there. It's a gateway. I mean, you know, we all started somewhere, you right. know, uh, especially if you're getting into craft beer. I mean, this is a great foray into the IPA world, you know, uh, just to ease yourself in. Eventually, your taste buds are going to get not tired of it, but so used to it, accustomed to it. Then when you hit, you, you know, if you stepped it up and went to the sculpting, you're like, oh, wow, this is different. Let me, yeah. you know, let me taste around this. It's the same thing with wine. I mean, how did we all get into wine? What was the first wine we tried? I mean, I, I, I can remember drinking Vin Rosé from Livingston out of a three liter jug when I was 19 years old. I was just going to say, think, yeah, or, or uh, uh, E and J, you know, something in, in, your, in your mom's liquor, in your mom's wine cabinet or, you yeah, know, uh, an inexpensive <laughs> Chianti with a straw basket, oh, you know. Yeah, right. Right. But it got you into it. Eventually, you know, you got older, your taste buds developed, you know, and eventually you get sick of that. You try something else. It just zips your taste buds. You're like, oh, my God, this tastes this tastes great. What is this? And, you know, you, you go down that rabbit hole for a little bit. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, you made a good point. You know, I know, again, we just talked about our, our wine palate, you know, I drink big tannic cabs and, and Oregon Pinots. But, you know, I realized, again, if you drink 10 of those over the course of a month, right. Yeah. Your palates, right. you go, okay, I don't know that I can denote the difference. So I always switch back to, you know, I got a couple, if you look at the wine racks here, I got a couple of Pinot Gris and, and Pinot yeah. Grigio, some nice oaky Chardonnays. It kind of, I look at it as like that, uh, that uh, you know, like eating a sorbet and cleansing your palate. And so right. I look at those, right. you know, switch to white wine for a little bit, and then all of a sudden yeah. you can you can taste those things, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm all over the map when I drink, especially with wine. You know, uh, over the summer, I mean... It's summer, spring to summer to fall. It's rosé. You know, I was a bit, you know, going through different rosés just to write, you know, blogs about it, talk yeah. about it, you know, just tasting everything out there. But sparkling wine, I, you know, I love sparkling wine. You know, that I always go back to after I drink everything. Always go back to Spanish wines because I mean that's what I like. Right. You know, I I understand them. You know, and I, I get into it. But you know, if I could find if I could find any more two thousand one two thousand four Napa cabs, I'm all about it. I love those. Well, you'll you'll laugh. This- this is a, a funny, uh, I have a friend that uh, lives out in Boise, Idaho, and his wife, they're both from back here, and his wife is a big fan of uh, Raspberry UFO from Harpoon. Yeah, so he says, right. hey, can you, it's her birthday last week, can you go out and, and, and get some six packs, mail them to me, I'll send you an 09 Phelps insignia. I was like, I think, I think I'll, that's a good deal. I think I'll take that deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good deal. Yeah, will, you only wanted a six pack. Right. I will say, I will say that uh, mailing three six packs of beer isn't cheap. So the Phil's in it. That, uh, no, it was, a, it was a good trade. Not. It was a good trade. Yeah. It's, it's not cheap. And that's, you know, the, when I was shipping, you know, with the, the last store I was working at, uh, you know, I had to stop the beer right. shipments because it was so expensive. And again, people went to beer advocate or, you know, wherever just hammer me. Like I'm ripping people. I'm like, do you know how much it costs to ship a six pack of beer? Yeah. It's ultra expensive. Yeah. It's, not worth it you know i had to stop right but you know um i just poured the dead right so we're gonna yeah this is gonna start the argument that uh so i i i realized the other day that posting about pumpkin beers in Oktoberfest in august is uh yes. is about the same as uh posting anything about hillary or donald trump it, it starts this huge <laughs> argument about it's too early uh my wife's uh, just here and uh, came home from the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago and was Cutting up some heirloom tomatoes and drinking a pumpkin beer yeah. because you know what? Her favorite beer is pumpkin beer. She's like, I don't really care if it's in season or not. I'm enjoying it right now. But even the tomatoes. Yeah. Now, I, I, just, I just went to the market yesterday, farmer's market. and I mean, buying the tomatoes, the sauce, sauce packed tomatoes yeah. is what yeah. they call them. I mean, they probably have, you know, the big case yeah. lots of them. They're already yeah. out. It's like it's, it, it's only like mid-August. Right. What's going on? I mean, it's they're out already. They're pushing yeah. them out. But, uh, I mean, last week we talked about it with Brian saying, you know, we're going to talk about the end of summer. People are like, what do you mean? It's still summer. I'm like, no, nope, pumpkin beers hit the right. shelf. You know, summer's done. We're getting into fall. We're looking, you know, in another month, Connecticut retailers will be doing their Christmas, you know, harvest, right, yeah. you know, tastings. Right. We're looking to buy for Christmas, yeah. so, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's, you know, that's that's the that's this end of the business. Same thing with you. It's that That's your end of the business, too. Brian, I'm tired of seeing pumpkin in October. Hey, uh, listen, Brian. We, Justin, Brian, we don't make you buy it. I mean, you don't want to buy it. I mean, no. <laughs> Justin up top said, "Stop with the IBUs." Yeah, well, I mean, uh, stop with the IBUs, and that's why there's a good thing to have. Like we said, having this 
it's an imagined scale. So, but it's okay. it, it's okay. it's kind of like again, the scope and being here. Here's your perception of the happiness, and obviously, even keel is something that's not as happy. And then you can go to you know one of our loggers is 18 IBU. So if you really don't like hops, then drink long fin lager. You know, um, but uh, the dead. Well, I'm gonna go with that with dead ringer. It's our uh, it's our Oktoberfest. A true Marzen's true lager. I'm gonna pour it in my whiskey glass because why not? Yeah. The the Oktoberfest, for people that don't know, people that are watching, but watch it on the replay tonight, the Marzen comes from the lager side of the beer family. Right. And it was brewed in March and lagered and then meant to be drank in, uh, guess what? Oktoberfest actually starts September 15th. So it's really not that early for Oktoberfest beers because actually Oktoberfest starts in Germany on September 15th. So, yes, we're a few weeks early, when, you know. When does it end over there? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> just keep when going. People, yeah, when people are done drinking huge liters of, yeah. you know, wine stuff. Yeah. Huge, yeah. huge steins. Yeah. yeah. This is nice, but this uh, this has more malt, obviously. People that don't know about Marzen, this is a little more malty, yep. a little more caramel, roasted caramel flavor on it. Yeah, so we're looking. I'm just making sure I do that. Yeah, so when we're talking about, you know, IBUs, only, nice color. only 26 IBUs. Uh, it's a, it's 6%, you know, so nice, easy drinking. And, and you're right, yeah. you know. Nice malty flavor, so that little sweetness, like I think, which uh, people equate to maltiness. Uh, as you get, as you go up the scale of maltiness, when you get to barley wines, and you get that really, really sweet, oh. you know. Yeah. Well, good. You just you just mentioned some barley wine. A question came in today from my friend Jen yep. Jen Nelson. Yep. As a matter of fact, uh, what's a barley wine? You explain barley. She loves barley wine. She has a barley wine downstairs. She was going to pop for tonight. Yep. So it, it, it really is a big malty beer. Um, tends to they tend to be usually ten percent or, or higher. Um, and s as the story goes, the, the term barley wine c came into it because our uh, our government couldn't figure out how to tax it. It was a, it was a higher alcohol rate, uh, so ten percent and over, you're getting into that wine uh, wine uh, ABV. Yeah. Okay. So whereas yeah. most beers, if you if you think back, maybe 10, 10, 12 years ago, most beers were five, six percent, perhaps. So now yeah. you're looking right. at a style yeah. that's over ten. So the Bolts and Ice came out and it was seven seven right. change. So barley wines like, oh you're over ten, so they didn't know how to tax it, so they taxed it in the wine category, so it became barley wine. Made obviously yeah. from barley instead of grapes, but it just became barley wine style because of the tax because of the tax rate. Uh, Jen just said, I do love barley wine. I didn't open it because I knew I'd have to drink it all. I can't do it tonight. Right. I mean, that is an investment when you open a barley wine. That's the one thing I, I like about if you look at the you look at the bourbon cabinet over there. The one thing I do like about bourbon is <laughs> you can open bourbon, and yes, it'll evaporate and may oxidize over, over 10 or 12 years. But, you know, you can uh, – there's a lot of money back there that I don't have to worry about, you know, dumping down the drain. You open a bottle of wine, maybe you have three or four days if you have, a you know, oxygen right. system. But – uh, same thing with beer. You pretty much got to drink it. That's why, you know, we, we can get into, into that touch point of growlers and crowlers and things like that. And I was never a fan of growler because if you if, if you're you, you gotta you gotta share it with people. I mean, so you and I can probably drink sixty four ounces of beer in a sitting, but you know, it's it's an investment of opening a growler and having it go bad in a few days. You know, so huh. I mean, look at this tonight. This is a thirty two ounce growler. Oh right? yeah, there you go. See, swing top. Yeah. Uh, and now everyone's going uh, to 32 ounce crawlers. You know, uh, Oscar Blues yeah. invented the crawler machine, and you know, right. it's, it's this is cool. from a New England cider company. Uh, Wall for I do that's uh, uh, Sean, Hartside. right? That's Sean. Sean's a good dude. Uh, uh, Sean, I talked to Miguel. Yeah, uh, yeah Sean. Uh, Sean Hart's one of the one of the guys down yeah. there too. Uh, yep. really good stuff they're they're doing down there. Great. I mean, I mean, if you're looking for something with wine qualities, he really makes you know ciders that style. Um, I just polished off uh, before before we went live tonight. Uh, what do you call barrel-aged cider uh, fermented with blueberries? Well, yeah, I mean, and that's a whole other category. Now you look at um, the brands like Down East and, like you just mentioned, New England down here in Connecticut and a brand like Citizen up in up in Vermont. They're doing things that uh, – and, and Brian's on here, and you know, uh, you know, years ago we couldn't give away cider either. You know, you had – you had, uh, okay, <laughs> we had Woodchuck and we had uh, Magners and, and things like that. Now, the, cider now there's full doors of cider and there's cider for everyone. Right. There's dry hop ciders. Right. There's – Wine barrel aged ciders. There's rum barrel aged ciders, and that's a cool thing. I was up in Burlington a month or two ago and got a chance to see the background and, and talk to Chris, who owns Citizen, uh, and it, it's pretty amazing. Like I said, to, to, to someone who doesn't drink cider, at, and you know, in regularity, to go, ooh, I like this dry hop cider. Or I like yeah. this barrel aged cider. Yeah. You know, 
So yeah, same thing. It's a different experience. Yeah, they're very common up here. Yeah, right. All the I mean, we're coming up on the season here in New England anyway, too. Right. All the right, ciders. Right. Yeah. I went back. I went back to the session IPA. Yeah. I mean, this is this is. I mean, I like it. Well, same thing. I mean, you could you crush a bunch. Yeah, and you know, so we take so. We also make a mango version of the even keel. So we take that base beer. We add some mango puree. So nothing changes. Same base beer, same alcohol level. Um, so that that has sort of become my beer of the summer is the mango even keel because it just adds that, that yeah. fresh mango puree to that. And, you know, when it's 90 degrees out, you can you can crush a couple of those. Right. You know, we go back right. to that crushable term, you know. <laughs> were you guys – I mean, you weren't the first to be – to introduce fruit-flavored IPAs, though, were you? No, I mean, if, if you <sighs> – Fruit flavored IPAs, yeah. I mean, Grapefruit Skull was probably one of the first IPAs, but if you go back to you know brand, you know here in New England, look at Sea Dog Blueberry Wheat, you know. They're, they're, right. So there are there are certainly people that have added fruit to it, but Grapefruit yeah. was the one that really just kind of took off. It, it was that, yeah. that we had a Grapefruit to Skull and and it just it skyrocketed, you know. And it, but it's a, it's a nice balance between fruit and hops. It's not like. It's not like Lion and Cool Summer Shandy. It's not in your face, sugar sweet. It's a nice balance. You pick up a little bit of that grapefruit, but again, you're getting the you're getting the IPA on the other end of it. You know, you're getting the hops. Right, and we use like I said, we use fresh puree. It's been pasteurized, so there's no you know no infection. We we found a company that works with us, so all our fruit beers, it's it's actual fruit. You know, it's just puree, and and that starts the argument with you know how are pumpkin beers out now in in August? Does pumpkins grow? And well, you know, grapefruit's a winter fruit, so how are grapefruit out now? You know, most people don't know that grapefruits. Are, but think about when you eat fresh grapefruits in Florida; they're in the winter. So um, right. Right, right. So, but but again, uh, even going back to that cider thing, you know, apples are only in season for how long, right? So. Uh, yeah. Uh, they get not? Yeah, what I learned from Chris at, uh, at at Citizen is he buy he buys the fruit and he freezes it. You know, they, they crush it up, and they, okay. they they freeze it. So uh, it's very okay. silly. This one, we're just switching off the cider because you're going to open up the cow. I am. Soon, right? I am. Look, I even look. I even, uh, I even got. Is this the right glass? Am I doing it right? Is that right? Nah, pour it in, pour it in an open mouth glass. Oh, I'll for the love. Nose See, I thought I was I, doing it right. I hate oh, two oh, glasses. Oh, oh. <laughs> So I mean, going back while well, just going to get the kava, or he's getting another Wait, glass. This uh, better, that better. I don't have the kava myself. I'm drinking a uh, New England cider companies. This is their Pink Lady cider. Nice. So Pink Lady apples crushed into this. Uh, ABV on this is seven and a half percent. I mean, excuse me, it's seven and a half percent alcohol. Uh, no ABV. I don't have. Excuse me, I don't have the IBUs on this. There's no IBUs on this. No, it's probably but, there's probably yeah. They do. They do make a hop version of cider, though fresh hop version. Um, so I mean, you smell this in the glass. I mean, it's it smells like walking around vineyards during crush time. Yes, it's, it's well. I mean, you get a lot of yeast. You get a lot of like that apple skin when you're peeling fresh apple skins on it. Yeah, wash the head of that thing. You know, See if I know. Hook an eye out. I think I can still do this. You can do it. I got faith in you. You haven't lost that touch. Yeah. Boom. I know how to do it. So tonight I sent Jeff uh, a bottle of Spanish cava. For people that don't know, uh, cava is the uh, Spanish version of champagne. It's made exactly the same style as champagne. Yes, bubbles time. Bubbles are fun. Uh, Cava's, I don't want to call it the poor man's champagne, but it's ultra affordable. It's, you know, it's a third of the price of some really good champagne. Uh, again, made in the same style. They they do use different grapes. Uh, Unlike champagne, where they use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, uh, they're doing grapes like Macabeo, Vaiura, uh, indigenous Spanish grapes, uh, Zarello, Parrilleda. Uh, but you will find some guys that do use Chardonnay and Pinot Noir out in Spain. Real small quantities. There's a uh, what's the brand called? Anna Conadro comes in the bottle. I mean, the bottle is. I think it's the worst marketing thing, but it stands out <laughs> on the shelf. It's, it's, it's a ceramic bottle. It's pink like pepto-bismol pink Ooh, right sexy. so i mean yeah sexy you look at it but when you pour it, it's that nice dark pink hue to it nice yep. dry kava did you pour it yet i did so i think so my experience with kava is probably everyone's right fresh and a right it's probably fresh the, a, right. it's the leading brand of, of huh. kava right that yeah. everyone thinks is champagne but it's not. I mean, same. Yeah, I, I remember working retail where people were like, oh, champagne, you take them over to champagne. They go, 
ooh, that's expensive. Right, right. And then you're explaining, like, oh, okay, Champagne is from Champagne, and then you can get, drink California Sparkling or Cava, and I think most people think Freshenade, you use that term Champagne, but it's not. Yeah, it's a generic it's sparkling, term. Yeah, it's generic term. Yeah. So where do you smell? I like using an open mouth glass like that. I yep. really love smelling the wine. Brian said I should have used a pint glass. I don't know if that. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that uh, was going to work. But I, use, uh, I get. Uh, I get Granny Smith apple. Yeah, maybe. Yep, on that one especially. Yeah, you get some Granny Smith. Yeah. Uh, not that sweet. Not not at all. Nice dry. So again, I think I'm going to go back to my wine knowledge. So it's a brute. <laughs> yep. So brute is dry. Yep. Right. Yep. And it's, then it's right in the middle of the scale. Right yep. in the middle. Right. And then it goes brute dry and extra dry, but no brute. Right. Uh, I don't know. Let's start at the top. I mean, <laughs> Savage, you start going through right. the whole thing. Then you get so down I don't like German. I don't like German wines because I just go, oh, they're all sweet. I don't know. You, you can tell me they're not sweet, but they're all sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Side note, I did for the, uh, I, I teach up at Mitchell College. I teach their beverage operations course to their uh, hospitality yep. students. Yep. And they require me to do a, a Riesling class as part of their wine program. It's just I, way too confusing. Uh, not only is it confusing, but you're getting into wines with sugar content. And it's like by the end of it, if you taste six, seven, eight, one year I did nine just to right. go through the whole scale, the Predicat scale, which is what they use in Germany to, you know, degrees of sweetness. By the end of the night, my head was banging. And the next day I'm like, forget it. I'm yeah, never all that doing sugar. this again. Yeah. It's it's way too much sugar. It, it it's tough even to pronounce that. To pronounce that stuff is real tough. But to drink that, to go through that scale is is horrendous. Yeah, but, so for me, so for me with a for me with a with a kava, I think. Um, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I you know, obviously food pairings for me, um, oysters. I think you know, uh, yeah. as you know, uh, you see my Facebook feed. I'm a, I'm oh, a big yeah. I'm a big oyster fan. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that for me it would be oyster. I think for me it would be some sort of soft cheese, like a goat cheese. Like we we go back yeah. to that that conversation about Brian. Maybe maybe one yep. of his soft cheeses, yep. uh, something that's not overpowering. Um, obviously some fresh fruit. fruit. Yep. Obviously some fresh fruit. Um, chocolate, I guess. Probably maybe. I, I mean I drink kava with everything except for and then, something like big heavy like a steak or something. Right. But and then and then makes a great mimosa, right? Is that? Makes a fantastic mimosa. Are you kidding me? I do Bellinis with it, even yeah, though I mean, yeah. it's probably sacrilegious yeah. in an Italian household. Right. But uh, I'll do Bellinis with it just because it's a dry base. You're adding the you know the, the, yeah. the sweetness from the peach nectar. No. It, it works out. I mean, great ca- you know, good cava starts ten dollars or under. Right. You know, just just for that dry, sparkling bowl, you know, champagne style, especially you know, you look at the bottle if it's a traditional method. I mean it's 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 done in the champagne style. I mean you're getting yeah. Champagne, uh, close to champagne quality at yeah. a fraction of the price. Yeah. You know? No, it's good. I like it. Nice try. I mean, I sent you a kava. I, in my classes, you know, somebody somebody always brings, you know, a wife always brings their husband, you know, and he'll sit there with a puss on his face. I hate wine. I hate wine. You know, I'm a beer drinker, and I always have a bottle of kava around. I'm like, try this. Do you like this? You know, and... I mean, granted, he may not drink, you know, a Sculpin or, you know, any IPA for that matter. You know, he might be a bud drinker right. or something. You know, if I, if I can hook him into like a Kava, you know, that's kind of like a nice, I don't want to associate Kava with Budweiser, but because, because <laughs> of the bubbles and everything, lack of hops and right. all that, I could transition him over into that, again, gateway drug in the wine world, you know, and, and you know. 75% of the time I get them into it, they're like, oh, wow, this is tasty, you know, oh, you know, nice, it's dry, it's not sweet, you know, it's not martini and rosy, which, you know, a lot of people, as soon as you pour right. something, you know, that's that's the first thing they're thinking about, it's going to be sweet, you know, but they get hooked. Yeah, I, th- yeah, I think it goes back to, I mean, people just have to, you can't now just blanket statement, I don't like wine, or I don't like beer, or I don't like, because I always say, well, what do you like, you know, so that one of the easiest, you know, especially with dark beers, you know, you hear it all the time, like, I don't like dark beer. Yeah. Because people go, oh, 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 God. So I'm like, wait, do you like chocolate? Do you like coffee? Do you like this? And most people say yes. So I'm like, oh, then try this. So whether it's a, I mean, we make a beer called Victory Sea, which is a vanilla coffee porter. So I'm like, oh, you're saying you don't like dark beer, but do you like vanilla? Do you like, and they go, yeah, and they try to go, oh, my God. Right. But so that's that's with vanilla and coffee added, but you can get those flavors from a a stout or a porter. Right. Without, you know, just by roasting it. So if you like dark coffee and dark chocolate, then, then. 
then you then you then you should try those dark beers. Well, or I've, I I remember, I remember being at an event where someone goes, "Hey, listen, we drink butt. We're not going to like craft beer." I'm like, "Hey, listen, I have Longfin, which is a hellish lager. Right. Try it." By the end of the event, they kept coming back like, "You were right. <laughs> this is awesome. I love this Longfin lager." So here they have this thing in their head that I don't like craft right. beer, but they don't know. <laughs> Apparently, my dog does not like podcasts. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, yeah, my dogs don't either. They hear me out. They hear me talking to somebody. They get all excited. But yeah. no, that's that's the same thing with the wine world. You know, it's I don't like this. I think Cheryl's drinking victory at sea tonight. Nice. Yeah. But go back to those flavors. I popped open. I have a what do you call it uh, from Nebco, the Imperial Style Trooper. The last yeah, the yeah. last year. What was it? Six, seven years ago, before they had to change the label because of Lucasfilms. Yeah. I opened that up. Yeah. Last year, 2015 in May, uh, I had it sitting in my cooler at the other store I worked at for all that time, just sitting in there aging. You pop it open, I mean, you tasted the chocolate, I mean, tons of chocolate on it, you know, roasted coffee on it. It was phenomenal. Yep. So that's actually, you know, you just brought up a good point that's a question all the time, like aging beer. And I'm sure, I don't know if you talked about it before, I don't know if you talked about it with Brian, but obviously, you know, IPAs, if you remember, you know, Stone came out with a beer called Stone Enjoy by a certain date. Uh-huh. That that beer had a 35 shelf, uh, 35 day shelf life. And it was really just to educate people that hey, listen, hops hops degrade. Hops are meant to be fresh and, and vibrant. So uh, you should drink an IPA within the parameters of whatever brewery decides. So at Balance Point, uh, most of our IPAs are one hundred twenty days. Mm-hmm. We've got it down. We've got labs that say we've got Q and uh, Quality control people would say, "Hey, it lasts to 120 days. You know, it starts to degrade from right. there." Right. Um, so, so I don't recommend aging IPAs. Um, you know, drink it, pick it up at the liquor store, drink it fresh. Hey, if you find one in the back of your fridge someday, it's been in there for a year. Hey, open it, try it. You know, but uh, aging beers, you know, aging stouts, aging porters, aging high ABV dark beers. Yeah, absolutely. Barley wines. You know, we talked about barley wines before. Uh, that was a style of beer that I never liked until one day I had an event at Eli Cannons and, uh, we, we were talking, uh, we were doing road and we had road old crustacean, uh, that was probably at that point five or six years old. So this was in 2002 and this was like a 1998, uh, old crustacean barley wine. And I went, wow, I really like this. Cause when you, when you drink a barley wine fresh, they're big and hoppy and, and, but uh, as they age, all that hop drops off, and it's that big malt backbone, and it's like you want to put it in a brandy snifter and just kind of yeah. sit by the fire and 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 you know yep. sip it. Um, so those kind of beers are, are ageable, um, and and again, you want to store it in a place that's cool and dry, and you know doesn't the temperature doesn't fluctuate because that's another kind of yeah kind of misnomer like oh you can't beer can't go from cold to warm to cold to warm to cold to warm to cold to warm right. but it's really extreme right. changes right. in temperature like hey beer is best stored right. cold you know so but that's uh, any but, that's anything even with right. wine right i mean you know, right. keep it at cellar temperature you know especially if you want to age it you know the same thing with wine though i mean if you take something from you know a cold box put it in your car in the middle of like connecticut august has been hot and humid right. sure it's everywhere right oh put yeah it in your car in the trunk of your car it's 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 a living thing. People have to understand. It's the same with beer, especially beer. You know, beer wine very volatile to you know extreme weather temperature. It's a living thing inside that bottle, inside that. Can. Right. You know, think about you. You go from inside your house. It's you know uh, seventy degrees inside your house with the AC blare. You jump into your yeah. car with the windows that have been up all day. You're gonna be like, oh, you know, just dripping, right. pouring with sweat. The yeast in the beer. You know the. The yeast and the wine is going to go haywire. Your beer is going to get yep. skunked. Your your wine is going to go crazy. You know. Yep. Yep. That's where you get it. People, the same thing. You know. And I always tell people, you know, take the beer out of the cold box, bring it in your house, put it in the basement, just let it, you know, naturally come up to cellar temperature, or you know, whatever. It'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the same thing, like you said, I, I know over the years at retail, I've had people go, oh, I need to return this bottle of wine. It's, it, it's, it tastes awful. You know, it's like, uh, well, you know, what happened? Well, I left it in my car over the weekend and, you know, here it is. Like you just said, it's 85 degrees in Connecticut and it just gets baked in your car, you know? Yeah. Right. So final thoughts on your kava. No, I like it. Uh, I would say for me, again, not a, a sparkling wine drinker, but, uh, 
I think for me, this would be like I said with oysters, or, or perhaps uh, it's a great pick. Uh, even bre- even breakfast, even like I, you know, I, I said mimosas, but even drinking it straight with some scrambled eggs, you know, I think that's you know, it's kind of a light, light, light uh, early brunch one. The bubbles, I I love bubbles because to interact with food, especially if there's some fattiness in the food or anything, oiliness mm-hmm. in the food, bubbles. There's a tiny bit of acidity in there. They they make yep. the flavor pop. So when I was in the cheese world, you know, combining cheese with wine. Uh, I love sparkling wines with cheese just because, you know, uh, it just makes that flavor pop in the cheese. When the when you leave a cheese out and it comes up to room temp, the oils start excreting out of it. You know, you cut it into it. You pop, you know, you pop a cava or any kind of sparkling wine. It just makes the flavors pop for me. That's why I love I love sparkling wine with food. All right. So I said goat cheese. What, would you, what kind no, of cheese goat would cheese you is fantastic. I, I used yeah. to do – I used to do uh, – when I used to take around the – Beltane goat cheese from Lebanon, yep. Connecticut. Yep. I used to yep. pair it with sparkling wine. So I mean, it's like you put the goat cheese on your palate, it's a little thicker. You know, uh, it's got some acidity to it. But when you pair it up with a sparkling wine, the sparkling wine like cleans, scrapes your palate right off. You know, it cleanses the goat cheese right off. I think it works really good. You know, I. So you're saying the uh, the Humboldt fog I have in my fridge will pair it really well with this? Give it a shot. I think so. All right. All right. She's a great producer. Little- but yes. and you look at that humble fog. I mean, when I was in the business, when I was doing, when I was a cheese monger, we weren't called cheese mongers. We were just, you know, cheese schlep. cheese guy. Yeah, cheese yeah, guy. Cheese, yeah. yeah, I was a cheese guy. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, humble fog was like the top tier artisanal cheese back then. I mean, yep. look how far that's come. Right. I mean, I, some of these cheese mongers are. I mean, you know Laura down at Fairfield Cheese Company, yep. right? I mean, yep. look at her. I mean, she's killing it out there. I mean, she's taken it to new heights here in Connecticut. I mean, she's she's pretty well known around the whole cheese world, outside of Connecticut. I mean, right. back when I was in it, we you know we it wasn't about that. I mean, look at all the new brands that are out there, just like craft beer. Look yep. at look at all the brands that are on the shelf right now. I mean, back and, and, back right. then, I mean, what was it? Long Trail Harpoon. I mean, they're still there, but it's like look at all the other varieties that are out there, and look at all the different extremes you guys are taking it to. You know, pushing the envelope to really, you know, do something different to stand out. Right. Well, again, it goes back to, you know, knowing what you like. So if, if you know, I, I think, like you mentioned, Brian at Mystic Cheese, and, and there's so many good cheesemakers out there. But it, so for me personally, it's because I know Brian, I eat his cheese, I trust what he's doing. But then, yeah. you know, as I travel, you see other cheese, you're like, ooh, I like that style of cheese. Yeah. So, I'm, hey, I'm going to pick up this whether I'm in Vermont or Maine or New Hampshire or wherever, or here in Connecticut, like you mentioned, Beltane and some other yeah. cheese. Hey, listen, I know that style of cheese, so I'm going to try that. So yeah. it's the same thing in beer and wine and spirits. Like, oh, I know I like bourbon or I know I like kava. I got to I gotta experiment. You always right. have your fit. You always have your go-tos, yeah. but, but we all like to try other things. Yeah. So as we come to a conclusion of tonight, we do a little segment called Spit or Swallow. So... <laughs> <laughs> So I, I give it a swallow. Yeah. Good man. Look at yeah. you. Still don't think I want to meet you in a dark alley. After, yeah, no, uh, probably not. Clock after closing time. I don't no, want probably to meet you not. in a dark alley. Uh, on the even kill, definitely a swallow. Nice. Still, I mean, I'm going to swallow all these. Nice. As, as thick as that sounds. Right, right. They're all good. I mean, the sculpin, like I said, it's at the probably at the limit of my hop intake that I can take right now. Yep. Uh, just because I'm not, I'm not big on the bitterness. I know guys out there love that style. Uh, Dead Ringer, I like. It's good. Uh, it's got that maltiness to it. I mean, I think it, you know, that, yeah. that's the Oktoberfest style, the malt character, correct? Yeah, and as and as we move into that that fall weather, if you when we talk about food pairing, right. that I mean that beer, that maltiness, it sticks up to those big like us. You know, if you think about Oktoberfest, uh, it's sausages. It's it's yeah. big gamey meats you know so as we move into the fall weather whether it's a steak whether it's sausage whether it's you know whatever it that that maltiness holds up to the protein and that meat and even some of these bigger cheeses think about that beer with like a a nice uh cloth bound cheddar you know i was just gonna say that i mean i'm drinking that again as we're transitioning into fall i'm thinking shelburne you know uh Sharp, sharp cheddar. Even the yep. smoked cheddar would hold up against this. Yep. Apple season is coming, so I mean, I don't know how many people out there slice a little bit of cheddar, put it on their apple pie. That would, hey. yeah. So yep. there you go. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that would work. 
Yeah. I think that would work great with it. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, again, that's how I think we all think about, hey, what is what is this going to, I'm eating this tonight. What do I want to drink? Whether it's copper or whiskey or Oktoberfest or whatever, you know, so it's just, it, 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 drink what you like with what you like to eat, you know, and that's, the, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason, you know, it's not red with red meat and white no. with, you know, it's, right. it's, it's whatever you like, you know. I know some guys that are so, uh, you know, on both sides of the spectrum, they're so anal about, you know, doing the perfect pairing. I, I said on uh, one of my other uh, shows, I drank I drank a white burgundy with scrambled eggs. It was horrendous, but I was so into this white burgundy. I just wanted to try it that night. Right. I was so into it. I'm like, it was the only thing I had in my fridge. Who cares? You know, I'm not, I don't care. You well, know, I, I think just, it also, right. And I think also, like you said, is it within, see, I hear it all the time, whether it's dark beers or red wines, like, oh, it's summertime. I can't drink red wines or I can't drink dark beers. So I'm like, yeah, but what if you put a, a nice big T bone on the grill? Right. Right. You, I want a big cab. I want a dark beer. Right. So or, it, uh, I'm not saying mow your lawn and drink a Cabernet, you know, <laughs> or, or drink a, you know, drink a smoked porter after you mow your lawn when it's 90, but in the right time and the place, if whatever you're eating with, mm-hmm. You can drink red wine. You can drink dark beer in the summertime. You can drink, right. you know, white wine in the wintertime. Or even chilling red wines. There are some wine, red wines out there that probably taste a lot better if you put a little chill on them. You know, again, right, I'll, I'll disagree with you on that one, but that's no, that's, that's another podcast. <laughs> There's Chilber, some out there. Chillable Merlot was just a marketing. Uh, that's, uh, that was a marketing ploy. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was out of a box, though, wasn't it? No, I, th- I thought it was a Chilable. bottle. Maybe it was a bottle. It was Behringer. And then we can go to the box. We can go to the box bottle. We can bottle discussion. That's all. Can, yeah. Well, watch cans are coming in. Yeah, into Connecticut, can wine is big. It's big out. I, next time you're out in San Diego, oh, don't yeah. look. Oh, yeah. I mean, canned wines are big out there. They're starting to trickle into Connecticut. We saw some last year about this time. Then I mean, progressively, it just you know more and more guys are coming in. It's becoming more acceptable. To put wine in a can, imagine that. There's People well, I think I think someone. I don't know. Uh, obviously, my first one was probably Sophia with the, the sparkling in a can from right. Coppola. Yeah, right. Right. And then I think there's some Australian ones out there now that I've seen some Pinot, uh, some Pinots in, in cans. But you know, it's, my, uh, you, you mentioned it before. Weeks. Yeah, you yeah. mentioned it before about beer in a can. I remember when we first brought Oscar Blues to Connecticut. People were like right. beer in a can. Oh, who? Oh, right. come on. It's got to be garbage, you know. Yeah, we talked about this with Brian last week. If if you don't have a can beer, can craft beer between September and October, you're out. You know, you're losing out on huge marketing up here, right? Anywhere for that matter. You Camping, know? boating, you know, golf hiking, course, pool. golf courses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, being from a San Diego brewery, obviously the weather is all all those things happen year round, so it's easier to have cans, you know. In, in California or Arizona or Nevada or any of these states where the weather's you know nice year round. Yeah. Yeah. Cheryl, Cheryl said it's never too hot for a porter. So there you go. So go back to the cava pairing it with oysters. For me, it's porter and oysters are an amazing is an amazing really? pairing that people. Oh yeah. Yep. But with the brininess of the oysters mixing yeah, in with I the mean, roasty? No shit. Yeah, because think about, I mean, you know, there's some oyster stouts out there. So yeah, we're, correct, we're, right, people right. add some oysters to so that yeah, that brininess, that saltiness. Uh uh so yeah, never I agree, never too hot for a porter. Hmm. What would you pair the sculpin with? I mean, usually when people come in, if they want to do beer with food, I usually point them towards something like spicy Thai food or anything like that. Yeah, I think any IPA stands up to spiciness. I mean, yeah. in, in this case, like I said, the, the hops, the Simcoe and Amarillo are more that uh, that tropical hop. So, yeah. so some lighter seafood dishes, some white, you know, some white fish, some a nice fruit, uh, a nice salad, like a cob salad, you know, yeah. um, some some lighter styles. I mean, again. IPAs, the hops don't necessarily go like I, if I'm looking at a, a main course and some protein, it's usually a maltier backbone beer, you know, like an amber or a barley wine or something like that. But IPAs for me, yes, definitely, definitely spicy. But again, with the, with the mango and the, and the peach from these hops, you know, it can be any kind of lighter seafood Yeah, for me. No pun Excellent. intended. Fish, fish on the label and seafood. I know that's easy, but. <laughs> Excellent. Well, closing thoughts. Anything? Uh, about no, I mean, uh, so like I mentioned, uh, we we got some cool stuff coming up, uh, including a new brewery in uh, uh, in in Virginia, and then uh, I know we're talking about fall and pumpkin beers, but we we roll into the winter season with Victory at Sea, which is our imperial imperial coffee vanilla porter. 
So 10% Porter. That'll be coming out in September. Uh, and then we also have uh, a new style for us this year. We make Black Marlin, which is our porter. We're going to do a mocha porter, so with some uh, with some mocha and some coffee. Oh, nice! And that as well. That'll be out in September as well. So I know we're Very nice. I know we're talking about eighty degrees in August, but we're yeah. we're, we're looking ahead to to winter time. But and that's all through New England, Connecticut. We'll see some of that. Too. Yeah. So again, yeah, we'll be uh, we're in all of New England. We're in uh, like I mentioned, we're in forty five or six states now at this point. So. Uh, we're up and down the, the eastern seaboard, and, and Connecticut's a great market for us. And, and uh, amazingly, with all the new beers and everything, like I mentioned, 4,000 breweries in the country, uh, Massachusetts is our biggest market outside of California, which is right. pretty crazy when you think about the home of Sam Adams and Harpoon. And, and right. you know, we talked about brands like Treehouse and Trillium and Night Shift that uh, right. people still drink Dallas Point a lot in Massachusetts. So New right. England's uh, New England, uh, lots of crap beer drinkers. So huge. Huge. I mean, yeah. Like I was talking to somebody earlier. I sent the my next guest. I'm waiting for this stuff to come back up. Florida, Tampa, Florida. Yep. Huge. Yep. I mean, I mean, the more I talk to people down there, I mean, the craft beer has just exploded down there. I don't. I think I forget how many breweries they're up to just in the Tampa area. Yeah, I but mean, I have a friend that exploded. used to work up here for ESPN. He got transferred down. He he works for the Golf Channel now in Orlando, and he uh, I have to send him New England beers, and he sends me Cigar City and Funky Buddha. Yeah. So it's a well, it's a it's a, per, it's a perfect <laughs> trip. It's a it's awesome. That's, that's what I did. I sent him down a bunch of Connecticut beers. Yep. I, I sent him down Sharp Hill uh, Valley of Angels too. Yep. Wife to try, but uh, he's sending me up some Cigar City. Uh, there's another guy down there I asked to try Orange Blossom. Yep. Uh, so. Compare Connecticut beers, Florida beers. We're going to do that just to see the difference, you know, see yeah. what's going on down there. I mean, and that that's the whole point of this, you know, live stream podcast kind of thing. You know, uh, I know you're busy, especially all of us in the industry, Brian, everybody, you know, that I've talked to, you know, people, you know, we talk to on Twitter, doing Twitter yeah. chats, yeah. Doing Facebook chats. We get on this live stream, you know, I could send you some stuff. We can actually sit down for an hour a night and just, you know, just drink and talk. And that's the whole point of this, you know, not yeah, pretentious fun. way, just make people, you know, really get into it without, you know, the snobbiness around it and everything. And that's the whole point of all this. So, I so, say when thank you do, when do, so when are we doing the bur- when are we doing the bourbon show? Oh yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to do that uh-huh. on Saturday night so I can just sleep all day Sunday. We can do that. <laughs> yeah, can meet me, you and Brian. I think uh, if Brian's still oh, yeah. here, uh, we can do Brian a four way. Like, you, yeah, me, Brian, Brian was... and uh, Justin would definitely like to come in on that because he's a huge bourbon guy. Uh, Brian and I had a chance. Uh, Brian and I spent some time in Kentucky yeah. in my past life, uh, going down to Sazerac, and uh, so we can probably tell some stories. That would be fun. I'll look, yeah, let's let's plan that. Oh, he just said count me in. So there it is. He's coming in. Yeah, excellent. So we'll plan that. We'll plan a night. We'll pick yeah. out, you know, we'll pick out a bourbon we could all get, and we'll sit down. So so Pappy twenty, right? I know Brian's got at least a couple in his basement. So yeah, he's got it in his basement. If not, yeah, he, he can send us all a bottle of Pappy twenty, and we can share it, and then it'll be fun. <laughs> okay, it goes back to the beginning of this conversation. You know, who's he going to give that to this year? Yeah, you know what? I, I think it'll be fun. Let's all do something. Uh, people ask me all the time, what's my favorite one? And I have mine, and I think Brian probably knows what it is. But let's do something where it's like, hey, this is a – well, Brian just said we shouldn't tell those stars. Oh, so um, <laughs> so why, why don't we pick something that's uh, you know on a shelf regularly or maybe something that someone hasn't heard of, but it's our favorite bourbon, yeah. you know, or we scotch or, or, or whatever. So Yeah, we could do that. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks for the invite, and uh, oh, hope, thanks yeah, for doing we can this. actually share a beer in person at some point soon. At some point, yeah. Next time you're yeah. down this way, or next time I yeah. come up that way, we'll share a yeah. beer. I got to come up right. to the market before it you closes. Come, yeah, the market. When's the market end? October. Yeah, late October. October 31st. So you got you right. got a couple of months. When's the uh, cheese festival up there? Uh, when's cheese fest? October 2nd, my wife oh, says. So. My son wants to do the uh, rolling of the cheese. He wants to roll the cheese again. Well, yeah. All right, he's in. I'm coming up for that. All right. Awesome. Come on. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Uh, so social media. Yeah. I don't know. I'm never on there. So uh, no. oh. CT beer, CT beer guy. Cause that's where I'm from. <laughs> Not, uh, so uh, CT beer guy on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, follow my adventures of beer. Not Facebook, just, Jeff Nelson, right? just me. Yes. Just me. Jeff Nelson. Make sure you follow Jeff on all the social media platforms, you know, check out ballast point. If it's at your grocery store, your, you know, your local package store, pick up a, six pack try it you know yeah, get into do. it you know yeah. shoot them any questions on social media if you have questions about the beer again it's about developing relationships you know yeah, now that you see Jeff on, on this uh live stream 
place the face with the brand, you know, ask him questions, throw it out there. He'll be happy to explain it to you, you know, in a non pretentious, non snobby way. And as always, I'm Chris from New Haven. I'm a CSW on the retail side of business. You can find me at Wine School 101 on all forms of social media, soon to be a retail store in Connecticut. I and look forward to that. Yeah. I know you're not sharing yes. it yet, but, uh, you know, not sharing it yet, but I look forward <laughs> we'll to it. We'll wait to get that permit. As soon as we get yep. that permit, we'll light it up. Awesome. And we'll invite all you guys down. You know, yeah. we'll come down. Brian's going to come down. We're going to do Absolutely. the whole thing. All right. Thank you very much. Guess, Thanks, man. Jeff. We'll, we'll talk soon. Great night. Say hi to your wife for me. Tell her thank I will. you. Bye. Ciao.